in the summer. Hi everyone and welcome to Dive In, a live and interactive conversation about anything and everything ocean for ocean and conservation enthusiasts of all ages. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And you? I'm Sylvia Earle, explorer in residence, the National Geographic founder of Mission Blue, and an ocean elder. Thank you, ocean <laughs> elders, for making this possible. Thank you. So first, a bit of housekeeping, as there's many attendees uh, from all over the world who are going to want to participate. Later on in the program, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so via text to write it in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. You can also speak to us live by raising your hand. You can... Or your flipper. Flipper, okay. If you want. <laughs> um, it's the raising your hand icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And please take note that throughout the conversation, there will be some links for the attendees in the uh, chat box for your information. But today we're going to be talking about oil and fuel spills, along with their impacts on the environment. Sylvia and I have had the unfortunate firsthand experiences of dealing with um, these disasters and a lot of the aftermath of them. But first, but first I'm going to try to um, share my screen. Yes. <laughs> Sharing <That's> is good. <laughs> it's, it's always the exciting part. Especially when you can share this. Because the world, world is... is Blue. 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 Better believe it. <laughs> so glad that picture was taken. We should just keep it in our minds all the time. Even as we dive in. Yes. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Splash. <laughs> oh, I wish we could do that right now. I know. Just look how beautiful that is. Yeah. And then there's this. So starting back in the 1960s. 60s. This is oh. the uh, Santa Barbara oil spill, which really fundamentally changed the way that uh, oil and gas exploration was viewed in the state of California. And the world. And the world. Perhaps because it was Santa Barbara, because there were a lot of people there who were outraged at what was happening to their beaches, their coast, their ocean. <clears throat> there had been spills before, but this was a strategically located one. And there are others. I mean, it's just... Well, if this is this this image is taken in the aftermath of the uh, the Exxon Valdez spill, and here you see, you know, typically again everybody falls out on the beach and they try to clean up this uncleanable oil. Yeah. Uh, in this case, they were trying to you know steam clean it, <laughs> um, and probably did well significant damage to the creatures who might have survived the oil but didn't survive the heat. The heat, exactly, and. Over the course of history, we see this happening over and over again. You know, we've got this long list of names, the, the Amoco Cadiz, the Megaborg, the Exxon Valdez, uh, the Persian Gulf War. Yeah, deliberate. Um, which was a deliberate act. <clears throat> but, you know, time and time again, we keep seeing this happening. And it's this, this uh, reliance on fossil fuels and um, the need to transport them around, the need to extract them. This is the Deepwater Horizon uh, rig on fire in the Gulf of Mexico. Happened just before Earth Day, right? That's right. <laughs> How uh, remarkable was that? And the loss of, you know, 11 lives on this disaster. 11 human lives, and then there are all those other lives. Yes. Uh, all the creatures who, innocent creatures. Of course, the humans were innocent, too. They tr put their trust in the safety protocols that were not really kept in order that they should have been. That's true. I was fortunate enough to be able to serve on the Deepwater Horizon study group along with a large uh, number of other experts. And we looked at all the, uh, you know, the root causes and it, they all kind of come back to human error and hubris and the arrogance um, over reliance on on a technology and trying to be too efficient sometimes and just to see this sort of um spewing going on for on and on and on it's like never ending well yeah. out of sight out of mind one way to keep it out of sight was to pour just large quantities of dispersants <clears throat> just a very powerful detergent on the oil when it reached the surface got to remember that this is like a mild beneath the surface and there are not too many ways that 
except in the industry itself, that you can actually get down there. There are little, some little submarines that can do it, remotely operated vehicles, mostly operated by industry. Mm -hmm. That So you're really at the mercy of those who have caused the problem to be get down there and observe and to try to solve the problem. And in our episode on whales, we showed an image that showed exactly how much ship traffic um, is splayed out across the globe. And, and every single one of these vessels, um, you know, it does have the potential for disaster, but some of them are, you know, of course, in going through far more sensitive areas. And as the ships become bigger and more reliant on automation, um, that complacency and the reliance on the, just figuring that, oh, autopilot. it's on autopilot, yes. it's, everything's good, you know. Um, but it can really lead to some incredible disaster. I want to linger on this photo for just a moment because What's under the surface is still so largely unknown, unexplored, and therefore people don't care about it so much. It's true. But these deep sea animals tend to live a long time, and they're really important to the, well, to the way the ocean and therefore the world functions. It's part of the carbon cycle, it's part of the nitrogen cycle, part of the cycle of life. and. We're just beginning to explore and get to know some of these deep sea corals and those little red things that you see are orange things are brittle stars, relatives of starfish. And they are they're partners, they're buddies of the corals. You see them associated like this commonly in the deep sea. I say commonly, <laughs> nothing in the deep sea is, is common in terms of our view there, but we're getting better. We now know that the light that the deep ocean is not just a barren place. It is thriving with life. And when we have a situation where either a, you know, a ship runs aground and spills oil, or an oil well blows out, or whatever you know, combination or of pipelines. reasons, or pipelines, like whatever it is that happens. In the Arctic in Russia. The people are focused on what's, what's at the surface, what's coming ashore, and they're not really thinking about um, what happens below the surface so much. And also when dispersants are used, it intentionally emulsifies sinks. and sinks the oil. So then it sits on bottom. And we've seen that evidence too mm. during the Sustainable Seas expeditions at the uh, site of the Ixtac oil spill in, in Mexico. Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, even you know decades later, there's still a large, thick tarmac. Like, like, it's like tarmac. Yeah, on Just, the bottom of mm. that old oil. Um, it's very slowly degrading, but still impacting. Oh, the environment. But, you know, um, just a short time ago, July, <laughs> July of this year, July 25th to be exact, uh, the enormous bulk carrier, the uh, MV Washiko, ran aground on a World Heritage Reef just off Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. Um, that vessel is one of the largest of its class. It's, it's so big it can't fit through the Suez Canal. It's bigger than the Nimitz class aircraft carrier. It's this huge bulk carrier. And it, on board, it had over a million gallons of diesel, bunker, fuel, and, and oil on board. And over the course of several weeks, it just broke apart sitting out there on the reef. Um, went off course. Went off course, yeah, ended up on the, the reef. It should, should have never gone off course. Um, and I'm going to show everybody where Mauritius is. And today we're going to be joined. Um, by economist and ocean policy expert, Nishan Dinagran. And if you want to turn on your camera and microphone, Nishan. Hey, there he is. Uh, hey, Liz. Hey, Sylvia. Great to be with you. Ahoy. Ahoy. It's really good to be with you, too. I love it that we're looking that little green spot on the map to the east of Madagascar, south of India. And of course, there's Africa off to the west. I mean, to think that that's that's your that's your home, yeah, I'm so jealous. <laughs> it's such a beautiful <laughs> place. It is. I, and I have not I've been to quite a number of areas throughout the Indian Ocean. There it is. But this little piece of paradise I have yet to see. So I hope you will hope we can go there. I want you to show me around underwater as well as <laughs> what we see here. Uh, this is a, this is part of the UNESCO heritage site, Le Monde, on the. Uh, 
the west of the island, uh, the, the vessel hit on, on towards the on the right hand side. But this right. is a UNESCO heritage site. This is a beautiful, pristine reef. There's whales, there are dolphins there. It almost looks like an optical illusion of an underwater waterfall. That's what it's renowned for. So a pleasure we'll have you and Liz uh, <laughs> join us one day in, in Mauritius. Well, I've got a few slides. I just wanted to, so our viewers can kind of see what a remarkable and special place this is. Um, you know, here we just see how beautiful and clear the water is, the, the mangroves, the sandy beach line. Um, and of course, it was home to the dodo. Yeah, the dodo was home. <laughs> was home to the dodo. <laughs> we never go anywhere without our trusty dodo. So. <laughs> oh, good man. Bring back our dodo. But it's so it's so sad to think that, you know, this is an animal that has really gone by the wayside on in, in not not too long ago, really. Right? It collided with humans, collided with humans and disastrously for them and for us, because we don't have dodos anymore. They, they're just such amazing birds related to pigeons. Great big pigeon. How big? How big? Nishan? Uh, I mean, there's uh, the bone structure that's slightly bigger than a turkey. Um, so probably about you know a meter tall and you know uh, about a meter and a bit uh, wide. Uh, but yeah, incredible <laughs> creatures. But yeah, hit by all aspects of humans. Yeah, invasive species by bringing you know, mongoose and rats have been sought after for food, um, and then destruction of habitats in terms of the ebony uh, forest. So it really right. is a metaphor for how we're treating our planet today. And, and here's its closest really living relative today. Yeah, all decked out, beautiful. They do still exist, but we have to learn from our mistakes and not let this one go the way of the dodo. And another endemic another, animal. Yeah, I mean, pink, pink pigeon. We only had a few of them, a handful left, and we were, were able from the 90s to um, actually uh, revitalize them. And ironically, they were all being uh, grown uh, or bred in that small island that was at the center of the oil spill. And so wow. that's the tragedy of, of what's happened. This was a great success story for uh, conservation and uh, unfortunately we're in a, in a real jam right now. Right because you know when this oil spills it's not just affecting I mean obviously it affects the animals that are right there on the reef and, and in the water and underwater. In the water, and... underwater but it also there's also a lot of volatile um, chemicals that are, that are released for, into the air um, right. that can can have an impact on the shore-based animals even guys like this. <laughs> the, the flying fox, an endemic oh, yeah. uh, bat to, for Mauritius. So. They are but, such gorgeous animals. But then to see this this lovely, uh, you know, interface of this, you've got, you know, the mangroves and all these other uh, plants, but it's this sort of a, a tideland interface that goes on. And just on that one, Liz, before you move on, that's Ilo Egret itself. That was actually the island that was affected. Um, and you can see this coral, this incredible coral atoll that's grown up. And these are some of the endemic ebony forests. This is the only lowland forest that exists anywhere in the world. And it was right there in the Ospel. So this is a unique species that exists only in Mauritius. Right. That forest and is only in that one particular islet. Um, what, what and, you look at, and you're just looking at the geology of this rock. I mean, it looks very um, kind of porous, right? You know, it looks right. like it. It would be very difficult to uh, to manage if it was uh, contaminated. Well, I, I've been doing a little homework on Mauritius, and I understand that Mauritius sits geologically right on top of what is referred to as the lost continent, the eighth continent. <laughs> that Absolutely. Geologically speaking, this is just the little top that comes above the surface, but it's now that we are able to get into the ocean and really look at what's down there geologically as well as biologically, this revelation that the Indian Ocean, if you go back in time, the history of it is really quite remarkable. The, the island itself, I think, is only, I think, the oldest area of the volcanic rock that right. was about 9,000 years. But what's underneath, it's, we're talking a couple of billion years. I mean, it is really remarkable. You were so fortunate to choose Mauritius as a place to be born. <laughs> I, I wish it was a choice if you know that history, but just, just on that, um, you know, Mauritius is down here, um, Africa, Madagascar, and to your point, uh, Sylvia, you know, there was an ancient continent when India broke off, you know, formed Madagascar and struck China to form the Himalayas over here. And there's a piece of plate that goes on just around here from Mauritius all the way to Seychelles. So you can see that in any physical map, and that is the structure of the underwater continent. You know, what the Sayadamaya plate is, 
And that has some of the largest deep water corals in the world. So it's about 200 meters depth, the size of Belgium. And so the geology is unique, the biology is unique. And then superimposed over that is our series of hotspot volcanoes. So mm -hmm. Rodrigue Island, Mauritius and Reunion. And so that's where the active uh, volcano is. So you have this um, layering of geology that's incredibly unique uh, for, for anywhere else in the world. Let's go. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> dive, dive, dive. But somehow this happened, you know, and it's just, it's just, it's gutting it, and appalling to think that, you know, that in this day and age with as much technology and collusion avoidance information that we have, all these sorts of things on board um, to prevent a vessel, uh, particularly a really new and advanced ship like this from just Right. You know, and, into a reef. I but, mean, but you know, <laughs> there there is a point where we have sh ships of this sort, great massive structures, are vulnerable. Yeah, vulnerable to freak waves, vulnerable to going off course, with the consequences that really should not be. We we shouldn't do it anymore. We should not. We know better. We should look at alternative ways of power in our society. For one thing. We just can't afford to not only continue to burn fossil fuels such as this, but the consequences of shipping large quantities of these materials by means that we have evidence, we have lots of evidence <laughs> that it's really risky. It's going to happen, has happened. This is not the first spill. but because there's so much attention given to this and also the attention given to climate change. And thanks to you, Nishan, and some of your number crunching buddies as an economist, really taking seriously the cost to nature, the cost that we haven't accounted for prior, that we, we know better. We just have to do better. We, we have alternatives. But we're locked into the infrastructure that insists that we continue to do this, at least for now, but maybe this can be a turning point. Maybe this will mark the beginning of the end of trying to use vessels of this sort to transport materials that we don't really need, should not be using. And just reacting to that, and Liz, you know, if, if you want to click through, we, you know, we're yeah. happy to do that. Um, you know, Sylvia, you mentioned something really, oh, um, let me just finish, then you can show what this is. Um, you mentioned <laughs> something really important, right? You mentioned about the, the economics of what's going on. And I think that's a metaphor for, for, for what we're seeing. We have at one level, if you just go back, Liz, if you can, one slide, you know, you have a company that can run this large ship right which was meant to be transporting iron ore that's used for steel so you need coal another fossil fuel to make right. this, this steel um and then this spill happens and then there was this outrageous set of statements that it was the citizens of mauritius that have to be prepared this was a <laughs> ship this was a ship that was not meant to even be in mauritius mauritius has no oil and gas industry has no fossil fuel industry this ship was meant to be passing by yeah you know, the shipping industry demands a freedom of passage and yet the responsibilities are on islanders to then clean up this mess over here why does that ship not have the protection it needs for all that oil coming through that's the question okay. and so it's, this is another example of where the economics is wrong the uh, profits you know, the returns are privatized, all the risks are socialized. It's on the port. These are fishermen who earn $3,000 a year. So yeah. it was an outrageous statement to expect an island in the middle of you know, the Indian Ocean, who the fishermen don't even go beyond the coral lagoons for you know, six generations. How should they even be responsible for subsidizing the oil industry to protect our island from, uh, from, from this sort of uh, uh, disaster? Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt well, it, it's true enough, and and the fact that when something like this does happen, that there's there's not really a comprehensive plan of how to get it. I mean, it sat for what several weeks from before it actually started to to leak oil at this kind of quantity, and you know where is that response to to rapidly, um, you know, get to the site. Contain it. Contain it. Yeah, and I think that's a good question. It's sat for 12 days. It's sat for 12 days, and there's been a lot of um, arguments about should the government of Mauritius have acted quickly, and there's some legitimate questions there. But the real question is, what is the role of industry? You know, as we know in the shipping industry, the shipping industry, every other industry in the world 
is regulated by the Paris Agreement for Climate Change. Two industries decided to opt out, the airline industry and the shipping industry. Too sure. big to fail, where we had that before. And so if you want to be self-regulated, like the shipping industry has claimed to be, put the regulations to safeguard everybody else. This disaster has called a national emergency that has been ongoing for two months, right? So Liz, everything you said about 12 days worth of preparation, sure. But where is the emergency tug paid for by the shipping company and the insurance company and the regulators? Why should an island nation be asked to foot a bill for an industry that doesn't, doesn't even affect us? So there should have been a plan, but the plan should not have been the responsibility of poor countries around the world. It should have been the responsibility of the multi-billion dollar companies that have made profit from these industries, but are not put, pay, put in the bill for the, for the full cost of what it takes to actually run one of these industries. It's true. And, and, and part of the problem, I think, is that you know, they look at a place like Mauritius and think of it as being sort of a, you know, a third world country or a small nation that's not going to be able to defend itself in court or, um, you know, to, to really go back after some of these big industries. They're just going to be kind of, you know, forgotten about or just, you know, don't worry, you know, we'll disperse the oil. It'll be out of sight, out of mind before long. Um, but these people will pay for decades in terms of their livelihoods and their health. And just on that, Liz, yeah, they've made a big mistake hitting Mauritius. Let me just say that now. They have made a big mistake hitting Mauritius. Don't worry, yeah. this is not a defenseless country. Just no, you that's good. That's good because, you I mean, it's happened. We've mm -hmm. seen other countries um, around the world, uh, particularly, you know, small island nations or, or small coastal uh, areas where industry has really been abusive and, and been able through the courts or just through, you know, various um, strong arm tactics or power. <laughs> To, to quash the voices of the local people. So it's a lot of people around the world have come to really love your country. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's so special. You know, I think about the love people have for the Galapagos with their special, well, the nature of what, what lives there. Mm -hmm. and, and the same is true with Mauritius, the unique characteristics that there's a reason why it's valued as a world heritage place. It's why it's a hope spot. It for is Mission a hope Blue. spot. Yeah, and you've got I mean, these all of it, mm. and you know, animals around the island they can't evade the oil. You know, here we have the dolphins trying to <laughs> cruise to through, come up and breathe, and they yeah. And when they come up to breathe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they can kind of try to swim around it, unless of course it's dispersed, and then they can't. Then it's, they have to swim through it. But again, you get those noxious. Uh, the vapors that are released and they're breathing that in as they're as they're mm. just trying to come to the surface to swim. And, yeah, and, and as you click you know, on that, I mean, we, we've discovered, um, yeah, there's been at least somewhere between 50 and 100 whales and dolphins that have died right, in Mauritius. And the reason I say time. between 50 yeah. and 100, we don't actually know. The uh, fishermen were banned from actually going out. So when these whales and dolphins, you see the vessel at the top there and the lagoon behind where the seagrass is and, and, and you can see the oil strains going through. And um, uh, we only had, you know, we had about uh, 50 that came onto, uh, the, uh, onto the coastline, like that where the current blue. There were a lot more that could have just drifted away. And there was a lot more who were probably injured as well. You would know this from the Deepwater Horizon list. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the same thing. And also Prince William Sound yeah. and everywhere. So. Right. And that's just, you know, we were talking about the melon-headed whales. We have sperm. We have about seven or eight really important species of whales, blue whales. And this is the breeding ground for them who come up in the, it's the winter right now in the Southern Hemisphere. So they come up from Antarctica, the breed, uh, breed in, in, in these areas in the west and the east of the island and then head back. So this is the main breeding time. And um, uh, no, it's a, it's a real tragedy on multiple levels and every you know, dimension when you look at the species impacted. Yeah. And, and it's the kind of thing that, you know, it's, it's, the impacts are going to be felt for decades well, if, or longer and it's a it's a forever kind of change it's, yeah it change i mean it, it will get better gradually over time but it'll never be the same as as it would be if this hadn't happened yeah it's you've just shift the shifted the dynamic put uh, materials there that and, and here were again not there you, before and you can see the you know right of course where it is sitting on this reef and you get the mixing of the waves and it just kind of makes makes matters worse. But I think the compounding the problem, Nishan, maybe you can describe the the sequence here. That so, what do you do with a broken ship that's spilling oil? To me, the last thing you'd want to do is drag it out and sink it. 
<laughs> the first thing yeah. is you send it back to where it came from by whatever means. Well, it's I mean true enough. I mean typically when you know when a vessel runs aground, uh, they're in a normal circumstance they do have a response or they come out and they Offload usually it's it's the, usually like yeah. a, a you know coast guard involvement will happen at least here in the United States coast guard involvement will happen they'll go out they'll assess and try to stabilize the vessel they'll call in a professional salvage team they'll try to pump out as much oil as possible Absolutely. refloat the yeah. vessel and then use uh, tugs to to pull it off and they will then attempt to take it um, you know back to the closest uh, harbor uh, if possible and and try to stabilize it and, and kind of get it out of the area and you know s staunch the flow <laughs> of a, this is, of this fuel. perception that if you put it into the ocean and it goes out of sight problem solved <laughs> but in this you know in this case Nishan my understanding is that they did attempt to, to pull this vessel off with a tugboat which they managed which managed to sink as well is that true that was a separate episode, and, and that's another part of the tragedy, getting uh, Mauritian seamen in, you know, involved in this. This is, this is an industry problem. Why should a country like Mauritius be responsible for subsidizing a salvage operation by a multi-billion dollar salvage company? So what happened? You know, the vessel was on the reef for 12 days. You're absolutely right. This should have been an emergency. We know the currents don't change. They come from Australia through the Indian Ocean. So they were pushing that ship onto the reef. That ship was not going to move off the reef. Right? You need tugboats and salvage boats to immediately offload right. the oil and then bring that off the reef immediately. You know, that boat then dragged, and we were tracking this by satellite, it dragged for about one kilometer. And so this is where the risk of the shipping industry is. That's a single hulled vessel. How oh. are single hull vessels still allowed? After 1989 yeah, Exxon Valdez, we learned our lesson that all oil tankers had double hull vessels. The shipping lobby allowed this vessel, which has, you know, because the ships are growing bigger and bigger, you know, there's a million gallons. That's equivalent of 100 petrol stations. 100 petrol stations of oil, not normal oil. This is toxic ship oil. It's, it's like peanut butter. It's so yeah, thick. It's, right? yeah. it's, it's the worst thing that's at the end of the oil refining process. That was there for 12 days. And you're right. After 12 days, we had experts from France, the French government. We had you know, the, the UN agency, which is another challenge in itself, who was meant to be overseeing the entire mission. I mean, the, the expert came and said oil is like hand cream, which was another outrageous statement to be, be oh, made. Cancer causing substance. And so uh, the ship broke eventually. Um, you know, t t after 12 days, it split on the 6th of August. And then um, on the 15th of August, uh, it split in two. Now, you're right, Sylvia, it's a return to sender. You know, somebody had sent that ship over there, that should go back to whoever sent that ship over there. So the salvage operator, what they decided to do was to take that vessel and then sink it, the front half. And that is yeah, 300 meters, what you see right now, the size of an aircraft carrier. There are laws against that. The whole purpose of the United Nations is to put laws against dumping of ships. There is ballast water, right? That's a large ship that was empty. So there's about 200,000 tons of ballast water. And in a moment, Sylvia, I'm gonna ask you about what the impact of ballast water could be yeah. over there. There's sediment that could be you know, impacting, um, uh, you know, whether it's floating debris or other debris on that hull. And then plus the rust of the hull that can now impact the coastline for decades to come. We've seen that in the Marshall Islands and in other regions. Now that was dragged off um, in, a, in a mission for six days. The, the, we have photographs and videos taken by the, the police service and the Coast Guard that showed the weather conditions were good. It was calm seas, blue skies. That was a vessel that could have been floated away and taken to a shipyard, less like the Costa Concordia. Why right. was that vessel sunk, right? And I mean, maybe Sylvia, just, maybe just start on that one. Um, tell me all the reasons why we shouldn't be sinking ships. You know, if something goes wrong, you know, why, why is that a bad idea just to sink a ship in the sea? Because it's junk. <laughs> I mean, it's garbage. It's, it's, um, imagine taking something like that and pluck, 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 you know, plucking it down in the middle of New York City. Yeah, put it in Central Park. Yeah. Yeah, what, what do people just drop sky. it out? Yeah, just boom, right there. <laughs> this, the ocean is not a, just rocks and water. It's not empty space. It is alive and it keeps us alive. And we should be very respectful of taking care that we don't disrupt the chemistry of the ocean or the physical nature of what's there. There was a time, I suppose you can forgive 
our predecessors because there was a the perception that you could deep six things into the ocean and that it would simply go away. Well, the, that perception still exists. You want to get rid of nerve gas? Where do you put it? Oh, just take it out and dump it in the ocean. You want to get rid of nuclear waste? What do you do with it? Well, there are lots of, <laughs> not so many options there, but uh, I've been part of discussions about, well, just take them down to the, the, the trenches, the deep, deepest places in the ocean, and they'll be safe there, at least will be safe. But what is not safe because of what we are imposing on those the systems, the living ocean that, that keeps us alive. We're disrupting the, the systems. We've already done a lot, but now that we know the consequences, we're beginning to take the right measures with the MARPOL um, and, and dumping at sea. There are rules that are now coming into place. Right. And all the, the discussion about plastic junk that we're allowing to go in the sea, but this is this is waste on a mega scale. I mean, it, it's it's taking toxic materials and deliberately putting them into our life support system. Yeah, I mean, once you sink something like that, um, you know, it's a Herculean, if not impossible, effort to try to, you know, refloat it. <laughs> and you know, so it's just yeah. not going to happen. It's no, going to yeah. be there until it eventually degrades and and yeah. then, like you say that geologically been... speaking it may be a few thousand years <laughs> but yeah well, no, no, I, I think whoever whoever dumped it there is responsible for taking it out so if you if you put it there in this island you're going to take it out so uh, I, I don't care what it costs anyway that's a, that's another discussion so. yeah but you're right I mean it it's it was irresponsible yeah and, and should I, I don't know why it isn't illegal maybe it is it is illegal it's against five international laws so yeah. so let's I mean, I'm with you, Nishan. I speak for the ocean. We all should be speaking for the ocean. The ocean keeps us alive. We have to return the favor and do everything we can to prevent tragedies of this sort. The polluter should pay. I mean, they should be responsible. And but at the end of the day, I mean, we have to really look at our at our own, you know, habits as well as like how how many of us you know every day are using some of these uh, fossil fuels and, and thinking about how we can use less and how we can be you know better stewards as we just go through our daily lives in mm -hmm. uh, minimizing the amount of, of um, our dependence uh, dependence on mm -hmm. it but i mean look you know looking at this slide here this gives you some idea of how thick and heavy uh, this this uh, fuel is and yeah, i've seen such scenes in the persian gulf in in Alaska. In Alaska, <laughs> yes. Yeah. In the Gulf. In the Gulf. It is just irresponsible. People don't know. People really don't know. If they could see what you've seen, Nishan, and what we've seen, I think they'd be as outraged as we are. You, but we have to make it, we have to open that, that share the view, let's say, <laughs> right. and share why it matters. And it's, yeah. And it really did, you know, it's just... Just before you do that, Liz, just, just go back for one, one slide. You yeah. know, that slide captures a lot here. Mauritius is known for its golden beaches. And when we use the phrase golden beaches, um, it's a combination. Mauritius is a volcanic island. So you have this black lava rock, but then you have this beautiful white coral around the outside. So you have the black rock ero uh, 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 eroding, and then you have the white kind of corals. And that forms that combination. At the bottom of the, the image, you see that golden sand. That's a yeah. very unique composition. Right? Made of, it's not just you know, sand that's lifeless. You see micro shells over there. It's, it's living. It's the black. It glistens. It's a very unique color combination. Then in the background, you see a silhouette of a mountain. That's Lion Mountain, a very famous mountain in Mauritius that we climbed, a very iconic tourist site in the big nature preserve. Um, but in front of that, you see these small wooden hull boats. Right. That is how islanders in Mauritius live. There's no industrial boats. You know, we whales are protected, dolphins are protected. These are fishermen who were former slaves, indentured laborers who worked in the plantations, earned their freedom, fought for their freedom. They have this land that they inherited. Indentured labor was only abolished a hundred years ago, 1920. Wow. Right. Right. Hundred years ago, they fought for freedom. Independence 50 years ago, right? 1968, give or take. And so those boats are wooden boats, sailboats. There's nothing industrial. You asked a moment ago, Liz, about you know, uh, habits. And 
you know, Mauritius didn't have plastics in the oh. through to the 80s. And it was imposed because of cheap plastics in the 90s by other companies subsidizing and bringing this to Mauritius. We used to have straw baskets, um, wooden vessels. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is the driver? We, you know, yes, you can start saying it's you know, our lifestyles that need to change, but what is it about our industry? Who's financed our industries to allow cheap plastics and fossil fuels to come into impact countries like this? I would never have chosen those options otherwise. Right, right. You know better. Yeah, when well, you know better. <laughs> and, then, and then here they are being stuck, you know, trying to clean this up themselves. And, you yeah. know, you just look at... at With buckets. Yeah, yeah, buckets and mops and, and you so, know, it's just, it's just heartbreaking to see this because not only is this just sort of this, I don't know, it's almost this futile effort, but, you know, the health of these individuals is really being impacted here. You know, they've got the Tyvek suit or whatever, but they're still breathing those fumes. And it's just, you know, I, I, I just, seeing what I've seen and knowing what I know, I, I really worry for these people. And worry about the people, worry about the creatures and in the, the creatures, sea. Yeah, all the animals that are being impacted. And, and everything we see here, it's innocence being trampled upon. Yeah. And on that, uh, Sylvia, you know, we've had these tragic circumstances. We've had, you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 whales or dolphins that, that have died. We just had another report of a small island. There are thousands of sea creatures from, you know, eels and crabs that have been, been impacted. Oh. Um, and, you know, there's possibly human health challenges that you've mentioned, uh, Liz. Typically, when you have an oil spill, you know, I, mean, I understand that all not all oil is the same, right? What was on Exxon right. Valdez, what was on a deep water horizon, you know, just because it's, it's black and oil, it's not the same. They all have different effects in the ocean. So can you tell me a little bit about that? And what would you expect normally when you have a major oil spill? What are some of the actions you expect to happen in the first few days? Well, I mean, normally, again, there's that rapid um, assessment to try to to try to you know stop it, minimize the, the and to release. find out what it is. What find out, yeah, find is. out what the chemistry of it is. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, does the oil be fingerprinted? Um, in the case of uh, you know here in California, if oil shows up on the beach anywhere, it's immediately fingerprinted to try to understand did it come from a vessel or is it from a natural seep? Because you know oil in of itself does from ballast water. <laughs> does come up out of you know seeps on the seabed in some cases, um, but once humans have messed with it and refined it and mm -hmm. uh, you know done what they do to it, then it becomes a wholly yeah. different set of um, material. The, and the thing is, oil, obviously or maybe not so obviously, is organic. This is built from living materials, and you look around the planet, there are different ecosystems, different compositions. This is, these are ancient, well, living things from millions of years ago, but the they retain, fossil fuel, yeah. they retain fossil fuel, exactly. They retain their distinctive fingerprint, mm -hmm. their, their organic composition. So, and usually, and I, I suppose it's universal, those organic volatile materials escape into the atmosphere. It's an oil spill in the sky, right? If you will, right. And and it does. They do. That those volatile elements do. Uh, you know, they vaporize. They go into the sky, <clears throat> and that and, makes the, the oil thicker as those materials, the lighter materials. Many of them are really toxic, and it doesn't mean they've gone away. They just relocated into the atmosphere. But what you're left with is typically this kind of um, gooey or heavy gooey crud, <laughs> um, which, you know, it's in a way it's better to have it kind of in that gooey state where you can have some hope of, kind of scooping it up or, you know, capturing it in some way than to put uh, dispersants on it, which, oh, yeah. which just makes you, it far it, worse. Dispersant does exactly what they're intended to do. They break the oil up into little tiny pieces. So... Generally speaking, even though it's heavy crude oil, it tends to, to float. Of course, some of it does sink, but it's easier to recover when it's not broken up into little pieces. Right. And a fish can swim under a blanket of oil. Or a dolphin. A, or a turtle. Or a dolphin <laughs> and looking for spaces perhaps to come up to, to breathe. But once it's dispersed, you can't, you can't. There's no escape. It's like what we're breathing currently here in California, the, the, 
it, you can't the escape smoke in breathe, the air. B- breathing <laughs> the air. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, it just covers everything. But we saw that the, the biggest uh, impact we saw of that was during the Deepwater Horizon where so much dispersant was used. Mm, and um, they deployed without, right at the bottom as and, well yeah, as at the top. De- yeah, and now they deploy it right at a wellhead so that, and again, that's for economic reasons, so they can't really account for how much oil has spilled, so they can't be fined <laughs> um, right. appropriately. Uh, so if, if the fish could vote. Right, oh but it does, it disperses that oil throughout the water column um, and really makes it impossible for animals it, it, a impossible to clean up and be impossible for animals to evade it does not go away it just it doesn't go away broken into smaller bits yeah and i think that's you know i'm looking at some of the questions being asked you know uh, meryl Ant- um Ancutel hayes is asking the questions about you know the cleanup monitoring and, and and sign off and i think you're you're right there, there are a lot of questions in mauritius about how that oil is cleaned up what you're showing as images of the volunteers who immediately went out to try and protect what right. was going on and you can see that the mask the stench was like being next to a a, a gas station it is yeah so, so i mean if anybody's been next to a, an hospital yeah your eyes are just you know just pouring and you know your throat's burning it's just it's a terrible situation and given the unique biodiversity uh in the um uh in the uh island um it's important uh yeah, like, like this image over here um, you know, use of any sorts of chemical or biological interventions. There's, you know, I think three, there's physical, chemical, biological. Mm-hmm. Um, extreme care needs to be taken because you have no idea what the interactions could look like between, you know, whether it's the ocean bacteria that give color to the corals. And, and so I think the, um, the extreme secrecy uh, that surrounded the uh, cleanup operations caused a lot of concerns in Mauritius. There has not been independent scientific validation. There's, you know, yourself, Liz and Sylvia, who are available on Skype. I mean, nowadays with technology, everybody can use Zoom to come in and give verification of what's going on or valid. None of that's been take, taken place in Mauritius. And I think that's caused a lot of concerns, which is why there's been protests by over 100,000 people on the streets of Mauritius, outraged, not just at the oil spill, but what the response has been in terms of the cleanup operations. Yeah. Well, we can't just let this slide by, Nishan. Um, it has to be a new starting point, and there must be accountability. Right. Really, it's it's not acceptable. And, and, and on that, because it's this is not a free. Uh, I've got, I see a question from John here. Uh, he, John asked the question. Uh, how often, uh, oh, the question disappeared, but uh, how often uh, do ships like this, yeah, 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 how often do these oil spills happen, right? And we always hear the headlines of the, the big deep water horizon exit because it's oil tankers, but this was a bunker fuel, you know, and, right. uh, and, and my understanding is that these ships uh, have a lot more accidents uh, a lot more frequently. Yeah, they really do. And yeah, and thanks, we are gonna take, start off onto the, um, Q and A session right now. <laughs> Sorry, so I, I just it just popped up. I'll, no, I'll, because... I'll, I'll, I'll take care of you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but but don't worry. Um, again, viewers, if you do want to ask a live question, use the raise your hand feature at the bottom, and Arnold will call on you, um, and then we will get through as many of the questions that are coming in as we can. I got lots of questions for Nishan, so of course you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Gene is asking us, were dispersants used in the Mauritius spill, uh, despite what is known about how much damage they can cause, including to the microbial communities? So do you know, Nishan, have they been using? Right. So we have public statements by the companies who say no chemical dispersants are being used. However, when I asked them, uh, three of the four international organizations then asked me to um, uh, retrench their statements. They did not want to be quoted on the record saying chemical dispersants were not used. Right? That raises a lot of flags in my mind. If they don't want to be quoted on the record, and these are international organizations, including the regulator, the UN shipping regulator, who is meant to be coordinating the UN response, what really went down in Mauritius? Now, this is not an ordinary cleanup operation. You cannot have, you know, there's been over a hundred consultants now brought into Mauritius. Mauritius is a very educated country. It's one of the, yeah. uh, it's got several universities, uh, you know, Advanced Marine uh, Institute in, in Mauritius, the Fisheries Institute. Um, it's still a small island, but it's, it's, it's an educated population. 
So they were qualified scientists. We have a, a, pre, a former president whose uh, prime ministers are elected, presidents are like the queen in England, so they're nominated. She's a biodiversity scientist, right? A female biodiversity scientist. Yet they awesome. were, none of them were consulted in how the cleanup operation was going through. So something very bizarre is going on in Mauritius where um, they are self-certifying that no chemicals are being used. And yet we are seeing dark matter appear in the Blue Bay uh, Marine Park, which we have a thousand year old, uh, the oldest brain coral in Indian Ocean is there. And just around the coast, we also see this dark matter, some sort of algae. So now we're worried, are there harmful algae blooms that are being triggered because of cleanup operation taking place under deep secrecy. That's one of the big concerns that Mauritians are, are, are worried about right now. Right, and you said that the vessel itself was carrying uh, iron ore, is that right? The vessel, the vessel was apparently empty, but the captain refused, to, that was the one question the captain refused to answer was what was the cargo that that vessel was carrying? So there's a lot of speculation in Mauritius right now over that, but from what we understand publicly, it was empty. Because you're talking about, you know, having a, an, an algal bloom afterwards and sometimes, you know, that that in, influx of iron or, you know, fertilizer type uh, materials can cause a, a algal blooms. We know there was sediment in there because when the uh, when the vessel was sunk, it was video. And so you yeah. can actually see the sediment mixing with the water. So then in my mind, that's already a breach of some of the MARPOL laws uh, around uh, sediment flow. So the fact that the United Nations Agency, the International Maritime Organization, has not made a statement to get that, I found outrageous. It's been two months, they tried to get countries to sign up. And yet when this happens under their watch, you just hear stunned silence from, from this organization. So um, not acceptable. Right, so Talia yeah. is asking us, why aren't the shipping and fossil fuel companies being held responsible? Is it because power or money, or is it the way that they divide the MPA? Or is it some combination of the factors? Well, look, it's 2020. I think everybody's got a voice right now. Um, you know, the fight against climate change did not happen because somebody sat in a boardroom and said, oh, climate change looks like an issue or the climate crisis looks like an issue. It took individual leaders to step up. I think we all know the, the quote by Mary Mead about you know, a small you know, change happens, but it takes a small group of, of us to, right. to, 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 to bring about the change. And yeah. you know, you know, accountability needs to happen. You know, Mauritius is on the front line of climate change and biodiversity uh, challenges right now. Right? It's, uh, it was already challenged because of climate change on the reef, but our reef and our biodiversity were resilient and they were actually turning the curve. And Mauritius was the great success story. This industrial accident, this was not an accident, this industrial incident, because this is what it was. This was a man-made cause. It wasn't a typhoon, it wasn't an earthquake. It was man-made yeah. incident has created a set back Mauritius with fossil fuels and the way that the cleanup operation is going, it's setting back all the biodiversity progress that we had made on the uh, coral reefs. And so it's for all citizens to answer that question from Attila. It's for all citizens to hold those who are responsible to account. There are listed companies involved. What is their, what was their role and knowledge of all of this? If you're transporting something that's toxic, you need to be responsible and have full understanding of what it is that you're transporting, including the impacts on countries that are innocent. They are nothing to do with your industry. You are the ones who are responsible for that. And you, we expect you to come in and fix the damage that's been caused. Yeah, so uh, Meryl is asking and saying, because this is a lifetime cleanup effort with ongoing support, how can Mauritius get all the support that it needs? Hmm. So first of all, you know, we need to put pressure on the right institution. And we're not looking for charity here. Mauritians are not looking for charity. So I think there are institutions, there are organizations like the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, ECOS, very good NGOs, reputable NGOs in Mauritius. Um, and there's a spectrum of NGOs, but those are very good environmental uh, NGOs. And, um, uh, and so that, you know, those who, who want to contribute should contribute. But, but this is an industrial accident. The shipping, country, the shipping companies have three levels of insurance. You have the normal ship insurance that you get from one of the 13 organizations called P&I Clubs. And in this case, it's the Japanese P&I Club. That Japanese P&I Club is insured by a layer of reinsurance called the IG P&I. That means all 13 insurance companies put, to, put their money together. And if something is really bad, it goes up to reinsurance. So uh, something like 23 of the 25 big reinsurance companies, these multi-billion dollar companies like Swiss Re and uh, Allianz and Zurich uh, cover the shipping industry. And so um, uh, there was a report that went out last year that you know, one of their worst case scenarios was if a ship hits a biodiversity area like Mauritius, that, you know, they still, the cost will be north of $4 billion, $4 billion. 
the money is there, right? You can't have CEOs turn up at Davos every year and sit and talk about how we're going to save the world. But this is where it really counts. Put your money where your mouth is, do the act, take the actions that need to be taken um, and actually use the insurance to actually safeguard the countries there. So money is not the question. We don't need charity, but we need to hold those companies to account for what they've done to Mauritius. So the insurance will perhaps, quotes, replace the ship, but you cannot replace the the life that was destroyed or the chemistry of the water instantly reverse it no matter how much money you pour into it but you should use this as a turning point <clears throat> and take actions that will do everything possible to avoid such events happening again you well, get two things I'm sorry a, a point <laughs> where the ships are simply too large and single hull come on yeah that's that's kind of a, a no-brainer <laughs> especially a fairly new vessel like this one was it's and to just... go off course yeah for such a long distance without somebody saying wait a minute of, hey excuse yeah. me the, the stars the aren't lining up, up <laughs> properly up there i think yeah yeah so yeah. and, and you're right i mean the vessel is 13 years old one three now think about yeah. if anybody has you know, if anybody drives electric vehicles or what cars everybody's driving right now 13 years is not a long time no. Right? And so, um, uh, you know, it's very easy. The shipping industry has got a track record trying to blame the captain. And that was the narrative that went out of this shipping. And there was a party and the captain was involved. And um, I'm, I think the challenge with that is that the captain is responsible for the vessel, but there's a system in place. First of all, there's two individuals on the watch, right? Mm -hmm. So they're the watch guy, the number two was there. Uh, and so his deputy uh, was there. So it doesn't matter where the captain is on the vessel, there's, there's a system in place. The second point is what you mentioned, Sylvia. This vessel turned in the middle of the Indian Ocean, went in a straight line for four days. Four days. Right? Oh. So it's, the point is, you know, is, yes, there may have been an error at some stage, but there should have been a system. What is yeah. it that the shipping industry has been under, you know, not investing in? Was safeguards in place? Was there a light flicking out? Was there a second? Was the culture of the organization there? And so to your point about what the root causes are, this is what we need to address. And um, just to pick up something you said, one is make sure this never happens again. And yes, there needs to be an investigation and hold organization to account. But mm -hmm. the second is, how do we restore? How do we restore the habitat? You know, you know the, they've caused a mess to a area which is extremely important to Mauritius and the world in terms of biodiversity. And if there are technologies that don't exist, I'm expecting whoever has caused this mess to invest in those technologies. If we don't have a way to grow corals right now, invest in new technologies that we can have autonomous coral growing programs. You've caused a disaster in this country. We expect you to fix it, not just give a financial handout and walk away. We want a systemic way to actually address these challenges and turn the curve on what you've done to, uh, to Mauritius. Well, I think that would be really, be really helpful because so many times in the aftermath of these spills, you know, Deepwater Horizon being one, uh, Exxon Valdez and other, there have been these sort of these huge funds of money that have been set up and there's really how it's spent is is kind of bizarre and sometimes you know you'll see things like oh it's spent on a new hotel or it's it's spent on a, on a new boat for somebody but it's, it's not, not really spent on fixing what the damage fixing the ocean and so um you know there's a lot of hands in the in the pie but you know there's got to be some way to be make sure that the money is spent in ways that are really focused on repairing and restoring the systems that have been damaged and one priority should be to take that shipwreck out of the ocean do not leave it there yeah right now so anyway we have we have more questions oh, <laughs> and okay. i think there's a couple raised hands too um arnold will let us know if we get one but daniel is asking as a 16 year old high schooler uh, what can i do to help prevent uh, oil spills hmm I think that's a great, I mean, the fact that you're asking the question, uh, Daniel, I think it's fantastic at 16 to be aware that this is a real challenge and we have to deal with this. It's going to affect your generation, my generation, all of our generations, because in 10 years, we hit an irreversible tipping point where our planet starts to spiral towards a, 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 um, a very unsustainable situation where we lose 90% of our coral reefs with, 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 by 2050. 
I think right now, one of the biggest um, voices, you know, I've had some challenges with the traditional environmental NGOs. You know, they've been effective in certain areas, but have they really been effective on, uh, on some other issues? And one of the big voices that have emerged in the, in the last few years has been uh, Greta Thunberg from, from Sweden. She was, I think, 15 when she first made those, those speeches and addressed the UN and then 16, 17. And she has now become the face of a movement with Rebellion Extinction and a few other movements to really shift leaders' viewpoints and so, Daniel, if you're asking that question today, world leaders are leading to, listening to younger people. They're listening to younger people with conviction, with viewpoints, with uh, concrete proposals. And if you are um, uh, convicted that this is going to be the challenge of our generation, it's a multi-trillion dollar challenge. How do we transition from fossil fuels towards sustain? And, and those technologies exist. You know, we have battery powered technology. Look what Elon Musk has done. You know, where is the Elon Musk for shipping? Could you be the Elon Musk for shipping? Could you invent right. technologies that cause zero harm, but actually restore the environment as a ship travels across the ocean? That I think is the, the challenge for, 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 the, for the youth of the, of the future. Sorry, Sylvia. I no, you. And having that vision, this is where we need to go. Yeah. Even if you don't have the engineering skills, go find those who do. Yeah, you know, pull, and, pull, and these, pull these people together. We need to move in that direction. I have been around long enough to be a witness to this steady, steady, steady decline. You know, bit by bit, we're just losing. But we don't have to do that. We need to first recover, stabilize and, and recover, and then restore and get back to a place such as what, well, I remember as a child, you remember when things were in some ways better. I mean, we, we but it, it, we, we've used technology in, in both positive ways and some very negative ways. It's finding, it's, it's recognizing that we're a part of nature and that we have to respect the natural world as our life support system. I mean, we should wake up every morning and say, thank you, Earth, <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, it's, it's a, a miracle. And what can I do to make this little space that I occupy and using whatever I've got in, in my experience, my superpower of knowing, whatever it is, to go from this to recovery. Right. Everybody can do something. Right. Some and people have more power than others, but everybody has power. It really is re recognizing that we are a part of nature, not yeah. apart from it. Yep. And and that seems to be so hard to get across at times, but you know, when you just stop to think about it, um, you know, it, it's- Where does the air come from where, that yeah. you're breathing? And you know, and, and we really do need to put sort of the full, you know, the full costs um, yeah. on the balance sheet, which is why having Nishan here is so great. And you know, the, yeah. The economist, he can like crunch those numbers for us. <laughs> and, and even just reacting to what Sylvia said, like, you know, a, you know, it's a small uh, book club, but, you know, I've even, we've even published books on this, that there is technology that's being used, you know, in the age of algorithm, but what's the soul of the sea? Where is the moral compass for how do we use technology? Technology can be good or evil, um, or, or, or the users can be good or evil. We've seen that in, in, in technologies in Silicon Valley with what's happened uh, yeah, post-election. So every big technology company has an ethical use framework that's been developed to make sure technologies are used for good. And Sylvia, you opened by saying that there are a lot of you know, companies, the only way to go down right now is because of you know, um, the extractive industries mainly that dominate you know, 80, 90% of, of submersibles right now. But what are those new uh, sectors of the economy where technology can open up? And no, it's not just tourism. It's not, there are new advances with synthetic biology that can open up possibilities, new economic ways that biodiversity can be valued. That is the ethical framework we need for the future that can build these new multi-trillion dollar new sectors that can help countries like Mauritius progress. It's, it's well, absolutely clean energy true. is certainly in a big broad yeah. sense, right? You know, well, let's and, get that right. And we do, right. and we do see a disproportionate number of these of these uh, incidents happening around uh, island nations that have become so reliant on bringing in fuels to, you know, bring to serve the tourism industry or to serve all the uh, cars that have been imported to a to a space. And you know, if there are ways and means that we can kind of help to change that um, dependence on moving, you know, moving these. Uh, dangerous materials around then you know that's that's a, a plus yeah, be that 16 year old who becomes an engineer who figures out how to make better batteries without mining the deep sea yeah <laughs> or, or another, another terrible industry yeah exactly. <laughs> we, 
we, there are solutions. You're right. It's not that we don't know. It's just the will to apply what we know to move from where we are to get to a better place. But we're locked in to an infrastructure, locked in to people who have big investments in big ships or in big returns from the way business is currently conducted. We, we can't continue that way. We just can't. Yeah. Everything we care about is on the line. Life itself. But, but, but on that, Sylvia, uh, you, know, you look at the industries that have changed. You know, just 10 years ago, you know, there was a monopoly on how we sent people to space. Right? It, was, it was governments. You know? There was the US, the USSR when it was there, or Russia, right? a little bit of UK and Japan, and others, but basically two countries that dominated. Then a few other countries joined the race, you know, India, a little bit of Israel, um, European Space Agency, uh, Japan. And then um, all of a sudden, somebody had this crazy idea in the X Prize. Could the private sector do this? Right? And so they funded an X Prize. And all of us, you know, and, and when you, you look at the X Prize and you look at what was achieved, there was a lot of engineering that went in to send a, a rocket to space, you know, and twice within one week, which was the prize. But the biggest shift, the biggest achievement of the X Prize was a, sh was a shift in mindset, the That's change right. in mindset. Right. Exactly. We it need created that. something. Yeah. Sorry, it, yeah, it created something where you know, we believe that once only government could do something, and then all of a sudden, you know, we said, "Well, well, the private sector could do it." And now we look, and we, you know, I, we were able to track what happened with this vessel because of private satellites. We used advanced satellites using synthetic aperture radar to see where the spread of the oil was going. And that's a Finnish company called, called ISI, or Planet Labs, and Maxar gave the, the imagery and the tracks and windwards looking at the, the vessel movement. And so this revolution that's happened, and obviously Elon Musk is you know, the highest profile individual uh, in, in, in the sector, has happened because of a mindset shift. And so everything you said, um, Sylvia, yes, there are infrastructure and legacy systems, but the shipping industry only invests 1%, 1% of revenue into IT infrastructure. Banking invests 10%. The fact that they're not moving is because there's not a willingness in this industry to invest in innovation. And that is what's wrong. And if they're not willing to invest, they will be disrupted, just like the space industry and the car industry has been with an upstart like Tesla. And I fully expect that to happen within the next decade. Well, I think well, that takes us back to the, to the whole question of, and the takeaway from this whole conversation is, what can people do? You know, what can the individual people do? And I think that, um, you know, so oftentimes we're said that, well, there's not any of this investment happening in the shipping industry because if we're putting that kind of money in, then our consumer costs are going to go up. You know, that nobody wants to pay more for <laughs> things. And I think that that's just sort of a smokescreen in many ways, you know. Um, but so, Nishan, what do you think? What, what is the best course of action that, you know, as individuals, um, you know, just viewers who are tuning in today, that what, can, what can we do? Yeah. So if I react first, maybe uh, I'm sure you guys will have perspectives as well. So, uh, you know, I think if, if any of you um, own shares, if you're a shareholder, I think if you're a shareholder in any of these shipping companies, ask the hard questions. You know, as a shareholder, you need to ask those companies, what is their climate exposure? How much are they contributing towards you know, the degradation of our environment and our climate? And what are they doing to prepare for a cleaner future? This is something that G20 has ruled on. So you're within your rights as a shareholder to be asking those companies what they are doing. And if they're not, they're in violation of some G20 rules. Right? I think second, if you're young, like the 16 year old, I see uh, Laura's 18 over here talking about her last year of high school. And it's great to have, you know, yeah, you know, the maritime industry is not just for men. I mean, I think it's great to have Liz and yeah. Sylvia over here and it's something that, you know, I feel passionately about that it should be diverse, it should be inclusive. Um, how do we build the new sector of the future? I don't believe the, you know, the shipping industry and the ocean industry, it looks the same now as it did a hundred years ago, just a little bit of iteration. But in, the, in, in, in 10 years time or a hundred years time, what are the new industries that could be opened up in the ocean that actually respects nature? Right? Whether it's clean tech, whether it's synthetic biology, whether it's um, you know, new forms of you know, coral farming. You know? And so there is an action for those young enough to really not look at traditional industries, if you're passionate about the ocean, but imagine a future and go build that future. Don't go into an industry where you're following somebody else. Carve your own path, build that future. Um, and then the third thing is, um, you know, in just in a very short term, Mauritius is facing a lot of challenges. There are a lot of vested interests who don't want Mauritius to succeed. Uh, what I 
ask is that you continue to uh, hold the flag for Mauritius. Uh, it's not money or funding that's needed, but we need individuals to hold those who are responsible to account, uh, continue making noise uh, about this incident, make sure this never happens again. And the changes that are needed in the very short term at the UN regulator, amongst the insurance companies, amongst the shipping companies, happen and they should happen within 12 months. If they are held accountable, it will result in a turning point. Shipping, they say 90% of everything that we consume, goods around the world comes by sea. Right. And an infrastructure has developed that, you know, we're all served by it, but reforms are absolutely vital right now so that it isn't just what we have witnessed here, the ballast water issue. Right, we are mentioning that. Uh, the, 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 the way that fuel oil is consumed, and part of it is, <laughs> there are more efficient ways. The noise that goes into the ocean because of, of shipping. Right. It's a huge issue. The ship strikes, those huge propellers, the speed, the stirring of the ocean. When you look at a map of, of shipping, you wonder, you know, you're changing the nature of the ocean itself, carving pathways, plowing the ocean. You think, well, that's it's ridiculous. But when you are underwater and you see the disturbance when even a small ship goes by and those enduring pathways, they don't just close over and, and stop. You can see if you're up on an airplane, look down to see where a ship has gone. There are these pathways that cut through the ocean, and, and it's not just one or two ships. We're talking thousands, tens of thousands, that are now altering the nature of the ocean itself. We need to be aware of these issues and plan to be respectful of nature and the creatures who live there. Realize it's not just water you're passing through, it's somebody's home. <laughs> a lot right. of somebodies, the, the, the somebodies who keep you alive, the carbon cycles, they shape the climate, they shape the oxygen you breathe. It's, it's the whole cycle of, of, ocean, of planetary chemistry that is, we didn't know it mattered. We just scaled up shipping, not knowing that there was a, a cost that we weren't accounting for. That's why we need the economists <laughs> to jump in. And, you know, and I'd love to see, light on this. and I think it'd be really great to see people continue these conversations on, on social media, um, you know, look for the Ocean Elders um, hashtag to follow what Nishan's doing and what he's publishing and, and just keep these conversations going because I think the what happens so often is that there will be an incident like this and there'll be a lot of noise around it and then everybody forgets everybody forgets about it and then the next one happens and so we just can't let that cycle continue you know, we need to to keep these um these challenges and these concerns and um talked about and on the forefront of our you know our collective daily lives thinking about how we can um how we can truly make a difference and i mean we are at the top of the we're actually a little past the top of the hour now so i don't know is it you either of you have any closing remarks besides <laughs> well there have been some hands go up i don't yeah. really want to try to arnold do we have any hands raised before we uh sign off uh, um christina has been waiting patiently so christina if you're still there and you unmute yourself we'd love to hear what you have to say <laughs> she may be gone already yeah, she may be. This happens sometimes. I think Christina's got an issue with an audio. I see she has no audio. Uh, oh, I think she's back, back now. Okay. Um, well, if Christina can't do it, we'll try Cassia and see if she if she will jump in. Cassia? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Great, thank you for this wonderful and helpful conversation. Um, I wanted to ask about the shipping routes and if anyone is doing anything to alter shipping routes or exclude routes in uh, certain locations. Um, certainly like this scenario, it doesn't make sense to me that yeah, such a vessel with this oil will be allowed to be so close to you know, this fragile heritage site. Yeah. Uh 
Cassie, I think that's, that's a great question. It's an area that I've looked into a lot uh, now, especially with, with the crisis. The, we have a UN shipping regulator called the International Maritime Organization. Uh, unfortunately, this shipping regulator uh, doesn't act on behalf of uh, countries or the planet. Uh, it opted out of the Paris Agreement and its current plans are only 25% of the ambition that's needed in terms of us meeting our Paris Agreement. They have a very technical thing called areas of you know, sensitive PSSAs, right? Uh, just a, basically, it's a sensitive area like Antarctica, Arctic. Um, if they have a policy, it should be the responsibility of the regulator to inform every country that this is a policy. We all have the internet, we all have Google. We know which areas are of high biodiversity. I see there's somebody from Venezuela talking about uh, the challenge there in Venezuela. There's, you know, there's an oil spill there and it's one of its national parks in Brazil. Yeah. And so we know the areas of biodiversity sensitivity. So why has the International Maritime Organization, this UN agency, not gone out to those countries and already earmarked, this is an area that needs to be protected? So I think, um, I think uh, there are rules. Those rules are not being enforced. I don't see the regulator being willing to enforce those rules. And so I think one of our questions is to our leaders, do we, is the IMO fit for purpose and should the G20 and leaders that we know start to intervene to actually rebuild a new shipping regulator that's actually fit for the planet and, and for the 21st century? Yeah, and I think that, you know other things that we really need to kind of show more support for um, you know, local Coast Guard agencies, and particularly the ones that have like a, a science liaison component, like some of them do. They, most Coast Guards tend to be sort of, um, you know, like dis, like a discounted arm of the military somehow. <laughs> and, and they're not really uh, celebrated for the amazing work that they do in terms of, you know, protecting um, the coastlines, protecting mariners, and uh, helping to avoid disasters like this or prevent disasters like this. And sometimes they're just not given the support that they need. Um, you know, here in California, many of the Coast Guard uh, effort is really focused on trying to reroute ships to not be in the same uh, pathways as whales during migration seasons and, and to, uh, you know, to try to push them further offshore to get them to slow down and using technology to try to um, figure out how the, the physical impacts of shipping can be uh, reduced on, at least on the larger um, uh, wildlife we we really do know what to do. It's the will. It's the as will. Sean keeps yeah. pointing out to to do what we know is the right thing to do. With with satellites, you can track ships. You can track where the fishing vessels are. You can see this vessel was way off track for four days. Four days. It's and like, come that, on. <laughs> that should have been reportable, if not on board the ship. The ability to say, wait a minute, there's a big ship that looks right. like it's heading for disaster. Somebody call them up, ask them what the heck is going on. Yeah, and and that's you know that's where you know we really do need to give the support to our to our local coast coast guard men and women. Um, yeah, it, you know it might sound a little bit creepy that oh Big Brother's watching us from the sky, but on the other hand, when you're responsible, to have that much power, that much <laughs> risk under. You, on, there's, there's, you should welcome having somebody guide you through the ocean so you don't, you can minimize the risk. Right. It's like we have air traffic control, right? <laughs> right. All over the place and, and trying to avert disaster and uh, say, hey, pull up, you know, <laughs> um, there's a mountain coming, you know, something of this sort. But, <laughs> but uh, in the shipping industry, there's, there's not really that as much uh, oversight. Right. And, and, and on, on that, I respond, I know we've got some more questions. You know, yeah, this was not a one-off incident. In the last two months yeah. alone, we had, you know, so the explosion in Beirut, and I don't know if many of you remember that big explosion, that came yeah. from a vessel which had a flag of convenience, Moldova, and deposited a risky, dangerous cargo in that port. We right. then had the oil spill in Venezuela. We had, the, um, we had a big oil tank off the coast of Sri Lanka in early September that almost spilled 2 million barrels of oil. That would have been horrendous. And it wasn't even going to Sri Lanka. It was going from Kuwait to India. And it was 40 miles. And it started drifting towards the Sri Lankan coast. And chemicals were used there in the cleanup, by the way. Um, then we have right now, um, then we had a loss of 40, uh, 43 were, what, sorry, three were rescued, but 40 crew and 6,000 cows drowned in the middle or uh, just yeah. off the coast of Japan. Right, and yeah. then we've now got um, a ship off the coast of the Red Sea 
about to disintegrate with these pristine corals, a million barrels, that's gonna affect 150 million people around the Red Sea. So these aren't one-off incidents. There is something going on in shipping. There has been a spike in incidents in shipping and we need to know what's going on. And just like we've spent so much looking for the missing Air France aircraft off Brazil, you know, five, six years ago and the Malaysia Airlines, we need to have that level of transparency and oversight of the shipping industry as we have the airline industry to make sure that these ships, which are huge, um, they don't, A, they don't just go missing or they don't cause disasters, but they're causing issues that are causing geopolitical risk. These are not small yeah. issues. We've had protests in Mauritius of over 100,000 over the last um, two months since the shipping incident has happened. In Beirut and Lebanon, the government had to resign. So shipping industry is calling political risk and real oversights needed on this industry. You're here. Yeah. Well, yep. thank you so much. We, we really do have to uh, close because we've, <laughs> we've gone kind of past our time. And, um, but I, I so appreciate you joining us today. And, you know, perhaps we can have another uh, session and follow, up. And follow yeah. up on this and kind of see what happens there. We need to track it. We should. Maybe. It's one way to keep the spotlight on. Yeah, on we should it. have some progress reports and, <laughs> yeah. and uh, we want to see what what uh, what you what you have up your sleeve here <laughs> going either next re your next reports from the field and to, and to see what we can find out about what's happening underwater yeah yeah but i want to thank everyone again for joining us for this special episode of dive in and um we are going to we have this conversation with the ocean community every uh, couple of weeks but this month is here in california is known as sharktober because the uh, the white <laughs> sharks come back to visit us at that time of year and we're going to be having several episodes that will be focused on sharks and the people who study them and the sharks who study the people. <laughs> so right. You can um, find information about these upcoming episodes in your email and the Mission Blue and Ocean Elder websites and on our social channels. And a special thanks to Medley Media and the Ocean Elders for producing this. And um, this episode, along with past episodes, are going to be available on YouTube. So thank you again. And remember... We must protect the ocean as if our lives depend on it because, because they do. They do. <laughs> they do. Thank you again, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next time. We've got a date underwater, Nishan. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely.